I have here a cow class. I'm sure I've used this example before. I have a public int inside of this cow. cow and it's a moo count. Anyway, I have main here, and I made a cow called Betsy. I set Betsy's moo count to 9. I have a cow here called Georgie, and I've set Georgie's moo count to 3. So hopefully none of this is too new. I'm going to do, as I've done in several videos before, and draw our RAM, or our memory. And I've sectioned it off like so. And this is the stack, and this is the heap. There's one other part of memory I haven't been drawing. It's the static data talk about in a future video, but it's basically where all the static data goes that exists for the entire program, so it's not that interesting. Now, with this example I've drawn as, as I've done it here, let me see here. We have Betsy here. Betsy is a four-byte reference that will go on the stack. So there's Betsy, and we say new cow, and again, new's responsibility is to go out to the heap here and say, hey, is there room out here somewhere for a cow? Well, there's really nothing on our heap right now, so let's just put a cow out here we'll, we'll put it put it down here right there and it's 32 bits so I don't know why I'm drawing it too big but it's a 32 bit instance of a cow and why is it 32 bits because it only has one int in it remember int is short for system dot int 32 the compiler simply does a replacement there and the 32 means 32 bits or four might. So every time I instantiate a cow, I get 32 bits for an instance of a cow. New returns the address of this cow out here, and we assign that to Betsy. So Betsy will reference, or internally it's actually pointing to, but we call it references in C Sharp. It's referencing this cow instance out there, and it gets assigned to that address like so. And then we further say Pet Betsy, your moo count, gets 9, which will place a 9 in, to, in this integer location right there. And then we further have Georgie right here, and same exact setup as Betsy, except we set Georgie's move count to 3. So allow me to do Georgie in a different color here, and this will be G for Georgie, and Georgie references another instance of a cow, and the move count will be 3. Now, I have drawn several of these for you before in several videos in exactly the same way. And the reason why these references are on the stack is because they're declared inside the scope of a method. Had I put Betsy and Georgie inside of another class, then it would be references out embedded inside of an instance of a class out here. But anyway, I've drawn this memory location for you several times in several prior videos. And this is how I've described it, and I lay, lined it up like this. But I really didn't tell you that I was actually lying to you. And all of a sudden, when a teacher lies to you, you think, oh, no, everything I've learned is wrong. <laughs> I remember in college, like in my third year, I'd have nightmares. I'd wake up thinking, oh, everything they're teaching me is wrong. I've just wasted three years of my life. Okay, well, well, calm down. Calm down. Everything I've taught you is correct. I've just left out some details. Right, I sound like a good politician, don't I? Every time you instantiate an object, you just don't get the 32 bits or enough bits for every field inside of that object. You also, in addition to getting those 32 bits, you get two other pointers. Okay, and one is the uh, sync block index. I'll just put SBI here. I won't even talk about that probably in this video. We'll probably wait till the next video to do that. But then right here we have the type object pointer. Okay, so there's there's Georgie's data and then Betsy will do this exact same thing. Right here there is the sync block index, which we'll wait for another video. That's sync block index. And then we have type object pointer right here. The one I want to focus on in this video is the type object pointer. The type object pointer allows us and the CLR runtime, the .NET runtime that's actually responsible for executing your code, to know about the actual type of your object at runtime. Okay, whenever we do a cast, I've shown you is and as and the cast using parentheses, which I'll call the parenthetical cast, just to sound more technical. But whenever you do a cast, the runtime has to ensure that what you're doing is correct. And if, if you do a cast to an invalid type, that's fine. I'll either chuck an exception in your face, as is the case with the parenthetical cast, 
or I'll return null, as is the case with the as. All right? But the way that it determines all that is legal is by looking at these type object pointers. Now, what are these type object pointers? They are pointers or references. Sorry, I keep using the terms interchangeably, but really it's kind of the same thing, uh, at least in, in C Sharp. In C++, totally different story. Uh, these pointers are pointers to instances of type objects. And type is literally a a type in the .NET framework, a very critical type, which allows us to do a lot of reflection. I'm going to put my cursor here, hit F12. You can see there's all these dandy lots of stuff. Okay, If you want to know what this means and how to use it effectively and all that kind of stuff, well, go watch the reflection videos, the .NET reflection videos. But Anyway, for now, the only thing we're really we really care about is the name, which gives us the name of the type. In this case, it would be cow. And there's also full name. And if we wanted to do some casting and ensure that you're down casting or up casting to the correct type, we could look at the base type of what you're trying to cast. For example, if I wanted to, uh, let's do object O gets new cow. All right, the compile time type is O. So all the compiler knows is it's an object, it's a general object. And I wanted to say cow C gets cow O. Well, at runtime, the runtime has to click in here as I've shown in previous videos and say oh you want to go to a cow let me make sure O is referencing a cow and the way I'll do that is by looking at the type object pointer of O which will in this case will reference a cow and then it can say oh yes this cast is completely digit so I could look at the the names and the types or the base types and those kind of things yada 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 I want to prove to you that these pointers exist the sync block index the type object pointer. I also want to prove to you that both of these instances of cow are instances of cow, thus their type object pointers will be pointing at the exact same type. Now what do I mean by that? Well, this type class that I've shown you, every type, in this case cow is a type, every type only gets one instance of this type object so that all instances of the type okay for example all instances of cow will share that one type instance right? that type instance is static for the entire program every time you want to look at the type instance for a cow you will get the exact same type object how do you get the type object well it's really easy Betsy.getType. type get type is a method inherited from object all objects have a get type all right let me let me try to illustrate this more when we when we instantiate a cow all right that's one of the type objects that has to be out on the heap so let's do it in green this will be the type object with loads of data in here tons of data in here but this is the cow type object so betsy and georgie here's betsy here's georgie they both reference this one instance of the type object, type object, an instance of type. Wow, I've said type a lot in this video. Ah, okay. I, I hope that makes sense. And then the sync block index in both cases will be null. Uh, I'll either finish that up in this video or talk about it in the next video. We'll see. It looks like time wise we're getting a little long. I want to prove to you that this is the case. And let me let me do it in two ways. We have a main class here. All right, let me just instantiate one of these. I'm going to say main class M gets new main class. That's kind of weird probably that I'm instantiating the class that that encapsulates main, but that's completely legit. So so watch this. I'm actually going to take you out to RAM and prove to you that this setup exists. You just if if you're not familiar with assembly code, don't worry about it, it will help, but don't worry about it, I'll take you through it. And then RAM, remember it's bits and bytes. I know in C sharp land we get a little bit too comfortable with, oh it's an object, oh it's a, a delegate, oh it's a, you know in the end, oh it's a, all it's all bits and bytes. So let me, this is one of those hardcore videos that you can skip if you want to. Let me, F11, here's our disassembly, this is native code, this is not missile C sharp code, or .NET code. This is native. This is what's actually executing on my CPU. You can see here I have my memory window, which is we are going to use to peek 
out at the heap, and then I have to scroll this out. It's the only window I can really adjust the font in. So turn your quality up to high definition so you can see what's going on here. I'm going to hit F10. You can see our original C sharp code embedded within the actual native instructions that the C sharp code produces. So we wrote this C sharp code, it produced these native instructions. I'm going to hit F10 here so we can get started. Notice we have two debugging arrows, one in C sharp land one in assembly land. I'm going to hit F10 in C sharp land which will move this debugging arrow down to this line and that'll further push this debugging arrow past all these nitty-gritty details down to right here. So watch F10. There we go. Now EAX is a register on the CPU. It's 32 bits wide. It has the address right now of Betsy. We instantiated Betsy and I want to know where Betsy is out in RAM. So I'm going to go debug, windows, registers, and now we're getting really cramped. I'm going to highlight the 32-bit value in EAX. Control C to copy it. We're done with that. Go to the memory window, say 0x, prefix it saying that what I'm about to tell you is a hexadecimal address in RAM. Please go there. Control V, the value that we had in EAX. Hit enter. And now we see, I'm going to highlight this just so we can keep it. Now we see uh, some memory. A lot of it's zeros. We have some E83C4B thing going on in here. I'm going to hit F10 over here, all right, which will set Betsy's move count to 9. Keep your eye over here and see if you can figure out what's going on. F10. Did you see anything change to a 9 in here? Voila. All right, that's Betsy's moo count. Now let's instantiate Georgie. But before I do that, remember I always draw the heap. Yeah, this is the heap, and I say Betsy ends up here, Georgie ends up here, which is true. The heap, you can go anywhere you want and put anything wherever you want. And the garbage collector is responsible for keeping things nice and clean. But a general heap algorithm is, hey, if you've got, if you've got room, just do things consecutively. So, you know, here's Betsy, here's Georgie right after Betsy. But if Betsy goes away and gets garbage collected, that's fine. Georgie's still left there. But the easiest algorithm is, hey, if there's room, let's take the next available room and drop an object out there, which is the exact same algorithm that .NET follows. So watch what happens when I instantiate Georgie. Watch if anything changes out here. This is heap memory. Watch if any... All right, F10. Did you see anything change? I'll give you a hint. A lot of it's in red. Usually Visual Studio, when it's smart and it can detect the change, it'll highlight it in red. Not always is the case as we saw with this one byte here. Georgie, moo count. Let's set it to three. Watch what happens. Any idea what will change to three out here? Any idea? Watch. I'm going to hit F10. Ah, uh, there's a three. Now, look at this. We have some number here. And then we have our nine, which is Betsy's moo count. And then we have a zero here, and then we have some number here, and a three, which is Georgie's move count. Any idea what's going on here? <laughs> First of all, I want you to notice these bytes are identical to these bytes. So these represent the type object pointer. All right, let me, let me get a notepad up here just so we can bring our diagram back up. Remember I said we had this type object pointer and both of these pointers would be pointing or addressing the exact same type instance out on the heap somewhere? Well that type instance is residing at E8304B00 hex but actually it's byte swap so it's the other way around so it's really 004B3C E8 out on the heap. Don't stress it if you don't understand Little Indian, Big Indian. Again, the assembly programming videos, if you really want to get into that. My main point is, these are identical. Right? They're both the type object pointer. So, what about all these zeros? Okay, we got zeros here and we got zeros here. Well, I told you in the previous video, or not the previous video, earlier in this video, that we also have this thing called the sync block index, which I'm going to talk about in the next video. But I, I hope I've proven to you that every object you instantiate on, on the heap has the data members for that type. In this case, we only have an int in each cow. But you also gain an additional two members, the type object pointer, which allows us and the runtime to, de to determine 
at runtime, not compile time, what the actual type of this object is. And then we have this sync block index here, which I'll talk about in the next video.